during COVID, we saw like 20% of listings just like disappear overnight. And people had the ability to work from home. If you had a second home and you lived in New York and it was up in upstate New York, you were probably moving to that second home. Maybe you used to rent it out on Airbnb and like now my family's there uh, and we're going to be calling it in. You had all the urban supply, like the the Sonder, the Domeos, the Stay Alfreds, the Front Desk, Lyrics, like all these companies just struggle. So many of them went out of business, inventory reduction, demand came back really strong in 2021. And then you sort of had this time in 2022 where we had really low interest rates, home values yet hadn't started to increase, and the average revenue uh, host could earn had increased 30%. And it was a gold rush. We joked on the podcast that you could put a tent in your backyard and rent it out I'm 100%. You're listening to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, a podcast for those who are in and around the hospitality industry who love, live, and breathe what they do. You can join us for candid and unscripted conversations with hospitality experts and founders as we go deeper into their personal stories while they're sharing their triumphs and trials that got them to where they are today. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and you're listening to an episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now, let's begin. All right, Slick Talkers, today's guest is a special one. I can't believe I haven't had him on the show, but today we have Jamie Lane, who's the Chief Economist at AirDNA, a leading provider of data and insights for the short-term rental industry. If you don't know about AirDNA, I would be completely surprised. With a deep background in economic analysts and a strong grasp of market trends, Jamie has become an authoritative voice in short-term rental analytics. He is also the host of the STR Data Lab, podcast, which is where he dives into data-driven insights and emerging patterns in the vacation rental market. And as a re reoccurring guest host on Good Morning Hospitality, Jamie's expertise enhances discussions on macroeconomic impacts, industry shifts, technology trends, and so much more. His ability to translate complex data into actual information makes him a highly sought after guest in hospitality and real estate sectors. So without further ado, let's jump in to our episode with Jamie Lane and enjoy this conversation. We went a little over our normal runtime, but it was totally worth it. As you'll hear, Jamie really can make hard data that a lot of us don't understand really digestible for people that aren't in that same space or going through the data analytics that they are every day at AirDNA. So enjoy this episode and thank you so much for tuning into Slick Talk. Let's begin. All right, Jamie Lane, welcome to Slick Talk for the first time ever. First time guest, long time listener or some type of statement. I don't know. <laughs> Happy Monday. Happy Monday. <laughs> no, sorry. It's Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, thanks for having me, uh, Will. Like, I've been a longtime listener, um, and it, and I think this all came out of you had Andrew Kitchell on five times, and <laughs> I had never been asked once to be on the show, and so yeah, here we are. It's it's crazy. I can't believe we've never actually had you on Slick Talk. And for the listeners who may not listen to Good Morning Hospitality or know that we have another show that I host uh, with Brandy and Michael and Jamie. Um, yeah, I can't believe this is the first time. Uh, Andrew Kitchell's a great guy. Love you, Andrew, if you're listening. Uh, but <laughs> this is surprisingly like, I feel like I record with you so often through GMH that I'm like blown away that we didn't have a Slick Talk episode together. But this is it. This is where the listeners that maybe listen to GMH or STR Data Lab, which is your podcast, um, you know, this is where they're going to get to get to know you better. We're going to get dive in deep on a lot of good topics, uh, maybe that we don't hear uh, on those other shows. So, Jamie Lane, I am pumped because we did some prep work. And for the listeners, let's set a little bit of a scene here outside of the intro of what I said about Jamie. Obviously, he's a chief economist at AirDNA, and we've had uh, Demi Horvat, the former CEO, on the show before uh, to announce some recent news on some acquisition stuff that you guys have done. Um, I got to meet with you and your guys' new CEO, Rohit, in, in Denver, grabbed a couple beers, got to hang out with VRMA, great stuff. So AirDNA is no new 
company. I think anyone who's been in the industry or just getting in the industry really does know AirDNA brand uh, beyond probably what most uh, brands wish they could do in our space. And you didn't start at AirDNA. You started actually way back when at CBRE, but I also know you've uh, you've got quite the extensive history. So where does your career and journey begin in the data world, uh, specifically in travel and hospitality? This episode is brought to you by Hostfully. Thank you to our friends at Hostfully, David Jacoby, Margot Schmorak, you name it. Everyone there is amazing. I actually got to hang out with a lot of the team, new team members even, you know, got to reconnect with Bryce Carpenter and many other people at VRMA. They're phenomenal. And their marketplace for property managers and hosts just like you who are listening to this podcast, is so good to get started, to learn the companies, to learn the way that the industry works and is evolving. So I highly recommend that if you're growing your property management business through co-hosting or just traditional property management, this is where you need to begin. Their channels, they have great, great channel integrations with others like Airbnb, obviously. Verbo, Marriott Homes and Villas is really important and such a big channel integration for them too. And many many more. So as you're growing and looking at scaling, this is a technology piece that you kind of really can't go without. So grab the link in the show notes, make sure you let them know that Will Slicker sent you from Slick Talk or else they're going to leave me. Just kidding. I'm totally just kidding. They've been with us for so long. Uh, I'm pretty sure we are here to stay. So thank you so much to Hostfully. And now we're back to the episode with Jamie Lane. Yeah. It, it actually started um, at a company called PKF Hospitality Research. Started there in 2010. Um, it was a fun story of a friend told me what he did. You know, just hanging out, 22, your buddy tells you what they do for their job. <laughs> uh, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm a hotel economist and like forecast the hotel industry, like <laughs> do all this interesting analysis. And I'm like, that's what I want. Like, get- <laughs> I was like, let me come work with you guys. And they're like, ah, like we might hire another economist in like a year. I'm sort of the only guy working wow. for them right now. Um, and then they called me in a year and they're like, you want to come work with us? And I'm like, yes, uh, absolutely. Let's go. Um, so quit my job, um, told my new job, becoming economist that I needed six weeks uh, to finish up my old job, went and traveled Europe, uh, for six weeks. Wow. <laughs> uh, actually on couch surfing solo, uh, which was, was um, sort of back in the day. Um, <laughs> and then sort of got going. Air, uh, PKF was then bought by CBRE um, in 2014. Uh, and in that time at CBRE, I was able to take on not only hotels, but learn um, uh, uh, oversaw forecasting for all commercial real estate at CBRE, uh, industrial office, apartments, sort of um, oversaw a team of nine PhD economists and data scientists uh, and really got to learn how a data org that does forecasting that processes millions of data points like works and works well. Um, And for me, that was a huge sort of growing up experience. Uh, of doing that for a, it was a Fortune 150 company. There's 100,000 people at CBRE. Uh, but uh, in, in the back of my head and really in my actions, like I was still like head of hotel research at CBRE on like my sort of side job. And then mm. my side side job was on the weekends. I was still digging into the RDNA data because I'm, be- I'm, and rewind back to 2015, I was the first AirDNA customer uh, while we were at oh, CBRE. Uh, uh, sort of, I was like finding people on Upwork to like scrape Airbnb data so we could wow. figure out what was happening uh, in terms of short-term rentals, how much they were, whether they're impacting hotel performance or not. Uh, so like when I heard about AirDNA, I called up Scott. And was, you got call the phone number and you like get the CEO on the phone. <laughs> there were only, Back in the good old days. <laughs> yeah, there were only three people at the company, the three co-founders that were sort of hanging out there in the garage in Santa Monica. It was like, <laughs> give me all your data. Um, I want reselling rights to the entire hotel industry and I'll pay you guys wow. $40,000. And they were like, 
done. We're in. <laughs> <laughs> and then from that point, they had like CBRE on the front page as a customer. Like it was, That's it awesome. was a big deal for the company. And, and for us, it was, and we were able to have that data. No one else had it in the hotel industry. We were able to tell the story of sort of the growth of short-term rentals. I was impacting traditional hotel performance. And I sort of built myself up as an expert on short-term rentals within the hotel industry. Epic. And there's so much to unpack. So before we get <laughs> into it, uh, obviously we have probably a good hour or or more if we have time uh, to, to jump into multiple topics. But I think the AirDNA piece uh, transitioning from hotels is really fascinating. But before we get into that, I do have a question I'm pretty sure listeners are probably thinking of or wondering as well. What qualifies or standards a, an economist? I've never heard of an economist <laughs> until uh, we're like, or at least an economist in our industry until meeting you. So, uh, can you just briefly just desc- you know describe an economist and what what qualifies that? Because I'm sure there's tons of uh, yeah. pieces that we're missing. Well, and I do have two degrees in economics, so I've got a undergrad and master's degree. <laughs> so school helps, uh, but. And how I sort of define an economist is taking and, and what and my role is, is to interpret what's happening in the overall economy and boil that down to what it means for our industry um, mm. and then track the trends in the industry and help you as a listener and someone that's operating this business on a day-to-day basis, someone that's investing into a business, whether you're investing into a home that you're going to use as a short-term rental or you're investing into a tech business that serves the short-term rental industry, uh, investing in, into as an LP into a private equity group that owns tech companies, whether you're um, in, um, a property management company, figuring how you're going to and why or how you should expand into this industry. So we all want to plan off of what's going to happen in the future. So it's as an economist, the role of an economist is to take what's happening now in the economy, what's happening now in this industry, and project that forward of what we think is going to happen in the future and how you as an operator, how you as an investor, and should think about future performance and how that might impact your business. Mm. So I should have called you before I invested in Top Key and Storied and a couple other companies in our space. Is what you're saying? I mean, um, it's not necessarily uh, that they're going to dig into the underlying business models, mm-hmm. but I mean of making projections and talking through of like what maybe if Top Key is going to work. And I love the guys at Top Key. Same. Like, Shout out. Happy with my investments, by the way, everybody. Right. Don't don't <laughs> and this is also not investment advice, disclaimer. <laughs> right. That you're that maybe that there's gonna be further professionalization in the industry, that supplies continue to grow. Uh, and that and if those two things are true, then a software centered around that we're gonna have more professionals that are going to want to manage their expenses in an efficient way, like that that could work. Um, Mm. so there's a lot of data that goes into understanding, like, is the industry getting more professional or not? How do you define more professional? Uh, and then, I mean, is the industry going to continue to grow? There's there's quite a few analysts. I wouldn't call them economists that were predicting that the industry was poised to collapse and that we are going to see, I mean, and hundreds of thousands of short-term rentals leave the market and that and cause a collapse in the housing market. Um, so like, and those are predictions that economists can and do make. Um, and that, and you want to make sure, and if you I believe someone's predictions that they have, I'm sort of qualified to make those sort of um, uh, procl- proclamations. So people aren't just giving out the title economists left and right. Oh it's no! A, I, I totally like ju- prestigious. I totally just like made it up one day. Uh, <laughs> actually, my my roommate back in uh, this was like 2012 because I started at C- at PKF. I w- I was just an analyst. Um, yeah. And then like one day I was like, you know what? Like I'm gonna change my title to economist. Uh, and I came home and my roommate was in and he had just gotten done with law school and spent like four years like getting this <laughs> title of lawyer. And he's like. 
So, so you just changed your title to economist today? I'm like, yeah, I think it better reflects what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's a quick title change. You know, never hurt nobody, except yeah. for the lawyers that have to actually go through law school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I love I love the story of like how you were the first customer of AirDNA because uh, I got to you know sit down with Scott very briefly, 2018, 2019 on the pod. Like this was when Slick Talk was really starting to take off right before, you know, ramping up in COVID and uh, I did a mastermind series, the 10 most epic vacation rental management companies, softwares, technologies, um, and Scott was one of them. So AirDNA was obviously a, a big name. And I was in Seaside, Oregon. I was a hotel manager of a 70-unit condominium hotel with a very heavy short-term rental, vacation rental market. Obviously, tons of listeners on the show are operators in this market as well. And that was I was getting interested in revenue management. I was obviously really excited about managing the front desk and the team and making sure that the property was profitable. But I started to see this little thing called vacation rentals and discovered AirDNA as well. And I thought for me, I was like, oh, this is the first time hotels is really bringing in short-term rental data and, and analysis into their their strategy, right? Uh, but you obviously were the real, real OG in that. And so what, I guess, like how... The way I want to frame this is like, how does one person grab this information and try to piece it together when it hasn't been done before? Obviously, I'm sure you had to have a lot of talks with Scott and the, the rest of the AirDNA team, but I'm sure there was a lot of learnings that came through that. So I'm just kind of curious how that initial beginning process was and kind of leading up in today, and then we'll go into some more topics. Yeah, and I'll admit like bringing hotel or short-term rental data into the hotel industry was a complete failure. Like mm. never made any money off of it. Uh, we sold some subscriptions, but it only covered the sort of 40 K cost of like, yeah. essentially gave me free data to play with. Um, and, a, and a big piece of it was in the hotel industry. Like I could see it being really helpful on the Oregon coast, independent boutique hotel, like sure. not a lot of comps out there. You go out and try to get your star report and it's like, ah, no one, no one contributes. So like, and there's not a lot of data to sort of build your, your industry off of. Are your, our, our star report? report was just everyone dropping rates because they're just trying to fill rooms. It was so annoying. I was like, guys, I'm actually trying to make money here. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So, and what we did was, um, and we tried to build out views that and would help someone that was sort of analytical at a hotel company. Um, in reality, it only ended up being useful to the, for the for the public hotel REITs, so the mm. um, uh, public companies that their investors were asking them, like, how are short term rentals impacting your business? And this was like 2015, 2016. Airbnb's growth rate was, and listings were doubling every year. People and investors were really worried on the hotel side of like, how much supply is this? How much is it impacting ADRs in traditional hotels? So really what it gave us was a variable, a, a data point to introduce into our forecasting models for the hotel industry to make our predictions there more accurate. Um, not necessarily that we're creating like the star report for short-term rentals uh, and bringing that hotels because quickly we found that they didn't want it. Uh, they weren't going to use it. They weren't using the star reports they already had of mm. their actual competitors in the hotel space, um, or at least most of them. So it didn't make sense to try to add another variable to their arsenal that they weren't going to otherwise use. Um, and I think we've sort of seen that, and in some extent with um, OTA Insights buying transparent of like, yeah. I mean, it, it's still, I don't think, a data point that hoteliers are looking at on a regular basis outside of maybe the unique and, and independent boutique hotels um, that they really have to be tracking how short terminals are pricing on a day-to-day -day basis. This actually might be a perfect segue then for kind of the, the first topic I wanted to bring up with you is like the industry landscape and comparisons. Because I know for me, when back in the hotel days, and I'm very rusty, right? Like I, I haven't operated a hotel in a long time, but I just know so many hoteliers we're so casual with giving OTAs the amount of money they're giving them, right? They, they really weren't like trying to find creative incentives or ways to really focus on book direct and other loyalty kind of features or products or offerings um, versus the short-term rental industry, I think is so 
much different. And I would be surprised, like obviously creating a star report for an in- individual host every month or whatever. That's a lot of work for ARDNA. Like with the amount of hosts that are out there, like over 8 million, good luck. Have fun with that. Like that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of reports to send out. But how does the current growth trajectory of the SGR industry compare to that of, you know, the traditional hotel sector? Cause I think obviously we've seen hoteliers get into short term rentals. We've seen now short term rental operators get into boutique hotels. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of mixing happening. And, you know, our good friend Brandy, they have mixed inventory, right? They're kind of hotel esque with short term rental. Uh, ops. So yeah, just very curious on your, your thoughts on all that. Yeah. And one is, and when you think, and I'm going to talk about the U S hotel industry just to like yeah, and separate that from some global U S hotel industry is very mature and mature industries typically grow like at the s- sort of same pace as the overall economy. So mm-hmm. like typical year, we get about 2% GDP growth and we spend about 2% more on travel every year and as an economy, uh, maybe 3% because people spend a little bit more every year on travel than they do on other things. That's sort mm-hmm. of the, the, the shift from goods to thing or t- to experiences that we've been sort of tracking over the years. Uh, but like we, you don't get outside of the fact that a good year for hotel growth, either on supply or demand or rates is like two to 3%. Hmm. And that's, and right now we're well under that at like 1% supply growth for the hotel industry. Um, maybe one and a half new, you got half a percent sort of churning out, uh, becoming obsolete. So, and then the big hotel chains like, and Marriott Hilton, like growing maybe four or 5% inventory, most of that happening outside the U S. So there's not a lot of growth. There's not a lot of innovation happening in terms of new product, new sort of things in, in the hotel space, um, very sort of mature. You contrast that with short-term rentals and like back in 2019 industry was growing 10, 15%, um, sort of seven, eight X, the growth rate that we were seeing in traditional hotels. And in the years after COVID was growing 20, 25%. We see entire, like we see so much innovation, people trying new things. Uh, We see so much churn. So we talked about like half a percent churn in traditional hotels a year. We've got like 20% churn in short-term rentals every year. So what that churn means is that there's some things that just aren't working. Mm. There's some things that are working and then you sort of, you see these movements of like, all right, like everyone now in Gatlinburg has got to put in a hot tub. Uh, And then you see people that weren't willing to do it. They turn out and then every new listing now has a hot tub and you can get to really nice, I'll call it professionalization, but I I think it's, it's more of like a real competitive product with hotels and you look at how short-term rentals have evolved just over the past six years, and the level of quality, um, the level of sophistication, and the number of operators sort of using dynamic pricing, using a PMS, listing a multiple channels, doing all these things that really make it where it's going to be a sustainable business has been evolving so much um, over this time period. And it's and it's just such an exciting industry in that realm where like in hotels, like you're like, oh, Marriott launched their 37th new brand and it's a <laughs> mid-scale extended stay um, that they're going to be using. Apartments by Marriott. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and you stu- do see some sort of interesting stuff on the tech side. Like Muse is great in terms of trying to change For sure. the way PMSs work in the hotel space, but it's just so slow to change. It can be so hard to sort of test new technology given the sort of oversight that the brands have on so many properties. And we're in short-term rentals. Like I've just loved how a company can come in with an idea. They can launch it out there. You can get 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hosts just by running... Uh, some Facebook ads to test your um, tool and get instant feedback. And if you've got something that works, you sort of see the sort of flywheel work of other people telling their their friends about it. And like, and great example is um, um, Bestie AI, 
Like they launched yeah. something a year ago and then one year later they've already got a million in revenue. Like that's just super exciting to see on how I mean, the industry can evolve like that. I, I don't disagree with you at all. And shout out to Sam and Arlo and the whole Bestie team. Uh, been super thankful to be an advisor with them. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've gotten to work with them a lot too with their product and um, just awesome. Too. Yeah, so I, I, I just, to yeah, I just had Sam on the SDR Data Lab what two weeks ago. Um, so he was, and it was amazing to see and that, or talk to him and that they're um, a partner with um, Uplisting, uh, our PMS. Yeah. So we're able to and push users, our, our users into using um, Bestie AI through the, the, the integration there. And like, and it's just one example of how and the industry can innovate so quick. They can, you can get sort of real time and feedback. And as long as you're and taking that feedback um, and yeah, bringing it back into the product, innovating, like, and you see so much new stuff move from like, who are these guys to like, Oh, like I see top, top key now everywhere. And like yeah. they've built a great business because they like really listen to their customers and, and solve a real pain point and are able to grow. One last shout out on the whole top key thing. Matthew on the team is incredible. The most hospitality focused uh, customer support guy like I've ever met. And I, I know customer support is not your real title, Matthew. So if you're listening, I'm so sorry. But you <laughs> are just an incredible, he's an incre incredible human being and he just takes care of every customer. And it's just crazy how above and beyond he goes. And so shout out to Matthew. John, if you're listening, give him a raise, more equity, whatever you got to do. But um, I want to go back to a, a point you made really quickly in the sense of the 20% churn in our industry. I want to know what contributes to that 20% churn. What do you think are the real attributes that are making operators get in and jump out? Yeah. Um, I think it, a, a big piece of it is just the transitory nature of short-term rental and listing a property as a, as a short-term rental. It's like, mm. yeah, and we talk with investors all day that are buying a property that they're going to list as a full-time short-term rental and that it's going to take like either underperformance or a, a change in investment strategy, something pretty monumental to cause them to delist that property. And mm -hmm. I think that is the minority of rentals out there. A vast majority are I've got a second home that I already like have. I'm going to see like, mm -hmm. oh, like maybe I, I do want to earn some income occasionally when I'm not using the property that like from that condo I bought in Aspen to use with my family during the holidays and maybe in March and like, hey, yeah, let's rent it out. And then you realize like, oh, this is a lot of work. Like maybe it's not worth it or maybe I want to list it with a PM and then you're like, oh this PM's a pain, like, and they take yeah. all their fees and like, now I'm only getting like 10,000, like, and now they limit me on when I can actually use it. Like, it's not worth it. So you have a lot of that. You also, in urban areas, just have a good amount of people that, and maybe they and inherited a home, they've got a second home that, and maybe family lives in part-time. You've got, and maybe snowbirds that are, and two homes, one in Canada, one in Florida, or Arizona yeah. or these different areas that they, um, and for life reasons, like rent it out a bit, don't rent it out a bit. Like, and my parents here in Atlanta during the winter up in Maine during the summer and like their house either sits empty or we rent it out Airbnb. Like some years we rent it out. Some years we don't, some years we find, and just a friend that needs a spot for six months. Like there's yeah. so much fluidity between short term midterm, long-term, I need a home for my grandmother to stay in for these few months. Like, like the way housing is sort of used, I think is changing. And I think short-term mm -hmm. rentals are a, gr and a great option, especially in urban areas of when a property doesn't, um, um, when I, I don't want to rent it out as a long-term or rent, mid-term rental, um, that I'm going to need some other use case around the property. Like, oh, okay, I'm going to rent it out for a few months. Like, 
that is such an amazing sort of unlock of value that short-term rentals provide that I don't think enough cities think about when they're sort of regulating where you think about a Paris and like where they put a limit of like, yeah. all right, you can rent out your home, but it's sort of limited to 90 days throughout the year. That still allows an amazing unlock of like unutilized time in a property of like, all right, like everyone leaves Paris during the summer, like all the tourists come in, like why can't, or why shouldn't I be able to rent out my home when I'm not there and have it cover the mortgage when I'm down in the South of France, sort of frolicking and not working uh, for those, <laughs> those summer months. Um, and some cities are realizing it and they're seeing uh, what a benefit it can be for their um, uh, citizens and others sort of don't. Um, and I think all those things sort of contribute to the churn of like, it's not real churn. I and mean, it just sort of is um, a visual representation of like how so many people are just coming in and out of the space based on sort of the, their needs of, of the properties that they own. Yeah. It's not real churn in the sense of it's just not full time activation of a, of a property. It's right. It's ebbs and flows with each individual use case. It's not like a hotel where it's legit just designed for transient guests. Vacation homes are a little bit of a personal use, family, friends, slash let's make some money or yeah. let's just leave it open. Yeah. <laughs> but like it, it, it does speak to the and problem that Airbnb and Verbo and booking have of <laughs> you've got to keep innovating on your business model. And if all yeah. of a sudden a whole lot of more people are starting to use it for midterm rentals, like, Airbnb, like you should evolve, like how you do payments for stays longer than 30 days. Like you should evolve, like what your service fee is for three month long trips. Like, and that's where I love that when they see how people are using their platform, that they're modifying their platform to suit that need, not necessarily trying to change someone's action to fit the platform that they built. Um, and that's where I see true innovation happening, like of realizing something that's happening that you can make that sort of product market fit just that much better if you, and make it easier um, and sort of evolving to how people are using it opposed to like trying to fit people into the model or the view that you have of how the product should evolve. So basically all the hoteliers that had the mindset of like, we've always done this, we've always done it this way. We've never, we've never changed. Like why, why would we do that? And like the OTAs can't get away with that. They have to evolve they, in order to stay relevant, in order to just bring, um, you know, the money in because that's how they get their commission. If their people aren't booking and they're not changing to the way operators are wanting to address it. Yeah. Makes total sense. So it can no longer be the excuse of we've always done it this way. We, why would we change it? Right. And what do you mean hotels don't evolve? Like they all realize people really want waffle makers and they all put a welcome waffle <laughs> maker uh, in the lobby for breakfast. Hey, continental breakfast for the win. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I just remember cause that, yeah, that that's one thing I know the listeners have heard this on the show many times, but the owner I used to work for prior to jumping ship was always, I was like, we're giving booking.com $180,000 a year. Why would like, we need to focus on other things like Expedia is taking less and da, da, da. And he was like, Oh, so the way it's been, what you're okay with that. Um, anyways, <laughs> moving on tangent or brandy rant over for those who know. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm curious. So there's these kind of topics all kind of tied together, but I'm, I am very interested to see like, what are the most significant economic trends are impacting short-term rental markets, obviously the ebbs and flows of the way people are using these, you know, this inventory, but economically, I know we've seen a kind of a crazy shift over the last four years, pre and post COVID. Plus I would even call post gold rush, um, 2020 end of that year, 2021, um, era, as we've discussed many times on good morning hospitality, but yeah. What do you think the overall significant economic trends are, are impacting us? Yeah. I mean, What's just been a wild ride for me is tracking supply. Um, supply yeah. and any manager host you talk to, it's like my market's oversaturated. I see so much supply growth. I, it's hard to compete. Like, and there aren't enough guests for all these listings. Like, what do I do? Um, and sort of going into that churn discussion, like during COVID, we saw like 20% of listings just like disappear overnight. And people had the ability from to work from home. 
if you had a second home mm-hmm. and you lived in New York and it was up in, in upstate New York, you were probably moving to that second home. Maybe you used to rent it out on Airbnb and like now my family's there uh, and we're going to be calling yeah. it in. Like you had all the urban supply, like the, the Sonder, the Domeos, the Stay Alfreds, the front desks, like lyrics, lyrics, yeah. like all these companies just struggle, struggle. So many of them went out of business inventory reduction. I'm sw- changing inventory from short term to long term rental, given that that's what I was really strong. Like a lot of companies sort of pivoted their business models um, for good reason. And what that meant was yeah. like, and we just, we had a whole lot fewer listings. Demand came back really strong in 2021. Listings did not. That pushed the industry to record performance. And then you sort of had this time in 2022 where we had really low interest rates, home values yet hadn't started to increase, and the average revenue a, a host could earn had increased 30%. And mm. it was a gold rush. Like you could, mm-hmm. and we joked on the podcast that you could put a tent in your backyard and rent it out in 100% because there was yeah. so much. Five grand a month. <laughs> I and mean, yes, there was strong demand for travel, but it wasn't like demand for travel had I mean, gone through the the ethosphere. All that I mean, we just had twenty percent fewer listings, and demand came back to normal, and that meant that. Yeah. And if you had a listing, you were doing very well. Um. So we had strong supply growth in 2022, 2023. and now we sort of seen the opposite effect of we have really high interest rates. And those interest rates are going to be higher for longer. Like if you're sort of sitting on the investment sidelines waiting, like, ah, I really want to, I'm 3% interest rate again. uh, And now they're close to seven and I'm going to wait till they're threes again. Like you might be waiting forever uh, for that to happen again. Uh, We've got home values that accelerated a lot. They've sort of plateaued but I don't see them going down anytime soon. So that's something that's very local though. And there are markets that are seeing decreases in home values. Like you're in, sitting in Austin, like, yeah, we've seen some pretty steep decreases in Austin or San Francisco. Um, but overall in the US and in most markets, we're seeing home values stay up. Uh, and then you've got short-term rental performance, like how much revenue are these properties earning? Like, yeah, they increased 30%. Now over the past two years, they're down like 10%. So now we've got like, all right, we're up about 20% from pre-COVID. That was five years ago that COVID started. Like, so that's a, yeah. an annual growth rate of like three or four percent. Like, <clears throat> that's pretty normal industry growth. So we're about where we would be earning, I and mean, without the pandemic in terms of ADRs and occupancy. So until and we expect sort of normal growth going forward for industry performance. Like, we're probably going to be flat on occupancy, get two or three percent on rate. Um, you're going to be able to sort of cover increase in costs, but I'm, we're pretty normalized in terms of industry performance right now. So now it's like, if it doesn't make sense to invest today, like, do we think home values are going to decrease or do we think interest rates are going to come down meaningfully? Or do we think, uh, industry performance, unit level performance is going to increase meaningfully the answer is there's probably going to be small incremental improvements on all of them, but it probably doesn't mean is that we're going to go from, and we're like four or 5% supply growth right now up to 10% anytime mm-hmm. soon. So if you've got a business model that is sort of predicated on 10, 15% industry supply growth, like you might be a bit disappointed, but if you're an operator that's been crushed by 10, 15, 20% supply growth, and you're like, can we just like pause on supply a bit and let us all get our operations I mean, back to profitability and sort of growing occupancy yeah. again in ADRs? Like that's where I think we've got some I mean, positivity and I think it's going to be a sort of a pause on supply growth for a bit. And we're still generating five times higher supply growth than the hotel industry, but for the industry, it's yeah. about a pause. Um, and then, um, and we'll see maybe 2016 or 2026, 2027, I'm, I'm depending on what happens in the housing market that we can start to see, see growth again. Well, I have two questions for you. And the first one I want to ask is more around, it just sounds like 
people normalized the gold rush that we had. They expected this to be consistent rather than obviously looking at the data that you guys have analyzed over many, many, many years, plus you know predictions and forecasting as well. It sounds like operators just normalize that expectation of we're going to grow like this. This is great. We're raking in money. This won't go away. People love our uh, love the product, right? Like COVID opened up the door when you got the two weeks of flatten the curve to be with the in the house with your loved one of the families, and you're like, all right, instead of being at my house, let's do it somewhere else. Um, it just sounds like we normalized, right? Like that's that was the expectation. And instead of thinking about like, oh, maybe this is just a quick boom, we should kind of prepare for the downfall of the boom. Yeah. Am I right and, or am I wrong? Absolutely. And like, and it was a, a funny time when I joined Air DNA because it was at the end of 2020, like just yeah. when like, and and we reached sort of peak industry performance in terms of RevFAR at like mid 2021, end of 2021. And that's right at the yeah. time when we were creating our first sort of industry forecasts. And like our first projection for 2022 was that RevPAR was going to fall. Mm. And looking through the history, RevPAR had never fallen in our entire history. And I come in and they're like, Scott, CEO is like, so you're going to create our first forecast. We've never had one before. And you're going to say that industry RevPAR is going to drop like 5%. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we're like peak occupancy. We're well above levels we've already been. We can see the supply wave coming. Like, yeah, like it's going to drop. Sure. And <laughs> so, yeah, and that's and why you want sort of an, an economist, why you want sort of these analysts looking at the data and trying to make predictions and trying to build models off of this stuff. Because like occupancy does, like you look at hotel data, you look at any sort of, measure of like occupancy that is sort of driven by supply and demand, like over time it evens out and it sort of oscillates mm. along the wrong run average. And if you get to a time where it's well above, that means people are earning excess profits and supply is going to come in. And if you get below, that means people are going to stop investing and, and that's going to allow industry performance to catch up. And like, it's just cycles and industry cycles, business cycles have been around since the beginning of time. And it's sort of applying that sort of thinking to now, okay, what's happening in our, in our industry. All right, Slick Talkers, this episode is longer than normal. So we want to make sure you are well caffeinated with Well and Good Morning Coffee brought to you by Well and Good Professional Services. And of course, Good Morning Hospitality as we've joined ventures in this coffee brand as our coffee is in all of the Well and Good homes and guests are loving it. So gone are the days where you have crappy coffee in your vacation rental that doesn't get used or just gets put away and out of sight so that way people have to look and think about the nasty coffee you're serving them. If you're serving great coffee, keep doing it. By the end of the day, craft coffee is where you can really enhance the guest experience and that's where we realized we can help our listeners. So you can go to the link in the show notes to learn how you can purchase or even get uh, well and good to become your turnover property management company where the moment the guests check out, they're able to go clean, service property, inspect it, and of course, ensure that your guests are well caffeinated for the next trip and the next stay. So as we like to say with Well and Good Morning Coffee, for the best stays, for the best days. So please, Grab the link in the show notes, stay caffeinated, my friends. And of course, we are back to the episode with Jamie Lane, Chief Economist at AirDNA. Yeah, well, very well said. And the, the second question I want to ask, and I, I never get political on the show. We never bring up politics or elections, but obviously we're recording this post-election day and we saw the Fed drop rates um, pretty quickly. I, I was actually surprised. Is that going to impact anything? Like, I know we're not like for the investors that are listening, waiting for that 3% interest rate, probably not going to happen. But the Fed is still dropping, potentially pr predicted to drop more. Uh, the yep. stock market is up. Bitcoin is up record numbers. Like, right? Like, all these things are seem to be up. Um, what, can you like, does this impact the outlook for the next two years? Or is yep. this just, again, probably a post election high? Yep. So, and a few factors there. And what the Fed does and, and is really impacted by what's going on in the economy. So like, yeah. how does the election impact what the Fed is going to do? In the near term, it doesn't impact it at all. 
Like no matter mm. if uh, the Democrats or Republicans would have been elected uh, last week, like Jerome Powell and the Fed still would have dropped interest rates by 25 basis points. Like that was baked in. And that's all the- They are. Sort of, they did confirm that that was baked in. That wasn't like, a, that was oh, okay, in. like we're seeing. A, okay, cool. No. Good to know. And there, we're probably going to have one more- we're going to have one more drop in interest rates in the December meeting. Uh, and that okay. like there's prediction markets on it. And like, and we were at like a 95% chance of a 25% basis point cut from the fed. And there's still, I think there's 70, 80% chance in, in December. And like, that's absent on what's happening in the, um, um, uh, in the white house. What is okay. going to impact maybe longer term, what the fed's going to do is any changes from the administration in terms of um, what maybe happens in terms of inflation? Because that is what the Fed is sort of charged with is two things, full employment and stable prices. And stable prices has sort of been defined as a 2% change in, in, in CPI or inflation on a yearly basis. So we want we're all comfortable with 2% increases every year. We don't want it too far below. We won't want it too far above. And if inflation gets too high and you got to raise interest rates to sort of slow growth and move it down, what the election does sort of change is like right now we've got a divided Congress um, yeah. and divided government. So you've got the Democrats in the uh, White House. You've got Republican control of the House. So in many ways, there's just not anything happening. That's going to change Stagnant. come January. The Republicans yeah. are going to control the White House, the Senate, and the House. And what that means is that they're going to be able to pass stuff, and more than likely, they're going to pass more spending. Uh, they're going to pass tax cuts, which will be um, and stimulatory to the economy. Uh, and more than likely, that's going to lead to more inflation, which is going to mean more than likely that the Fed is going to cut interest rates as much as they otherwise would have if we would have maybe had a Democrat in the White House and Republican control of the House and Senate, which probably would have meant that at least for the next two years that nothing was going to get passed and no new spending or tax cuts were going to be happening. Um, what that also means, and maybe and relating that back to the industry, and we were talking about yeah. supply growth and interest rates, is that, and because the Fed isn't going to be cutting interest rates as much, uh, that more than likely means that there's a higher floor for a uh, 30-year fixed rate mortgage and that we're much more likely going to be in the 55 to 6% mortgage rates longer term than maybe getting down to the 5 to 5.5%. Uh, so most economists' expectations going forward is maybe a little bit more growth in the overall economy. And, and we're going to be spending more. We're going to be cutting taxes, we're going to be I'm trying to stimulate growth. So maybe lower unemployment. Um, but then um, I mean, maybe a, a, a guardrail there of that the Fed doesn't cut rates as much, maybe even has to increase them again if inflation does start to accelerate. Uh, and that and sort of cools the outlook a bit. Uh, and then you have just the I'm really big unknowns of like what's going to happen on terms of immigration policy. Uh, for sure. Uh, and, and there's two factors there. One, if you just slow the overall growth of immigration that we have coming into the country, um, and we, I think most people agree that legal immigration is good, and really the overall yeah. growth um, of our country is sort of predicated on immigration, um, that people want to move to the, the U.S. the key word is legal, though, right? Like yeah, legal I, immigration. That's that's the key the key phrase. Yeah, there. that we, yeah. and when people come to school in the U.S., that they're going to, like, they earn a degree from Harvard, that they can actually stay yeah. in the U.S. and sort of contribute to sure. the economy. Um, yep. And, and innovation I mean, and, yeah, creating startups and, yeah, all the, all the fun stuff. Right. Um, and, I mean, if you look at, China, if you look at a lot of the major European countries, like they don't have inbound migration. Their populations are, and many of them are decreasing now. Like we're just mm. in, in the US, we do not have a birth rate that is replacing our sort of natural rate of like people dying. So unless mm. we have 
immigrants coming into our country, you're going to start seeing populations decline and all sorts of bad things start to happen in the economy if you've got falling populations. Because then you you don't need as much housing. Then you've got housing values that start to fall. Uh, so you th start thinking about and investing in a home that's going to be a depreciating asset. Like that's really scary. Um, you start and thinking about your economy that it's inflation's not going to grow, that you're not going to get a raise every year, that your salary might actually decrease uh, on any given year because prices are going down. Uh, so I a healthy amount of immigration is good for the overall economy. It's built on what the country was sort of built on and on growth. Um, and if yeah. we, and if that flattens or even starts to decrease and with, um, and that that could have a long-term uh, detrimental impacts to, to the country. Yeah. My, I'm very, yeah, I, I, we won't sit on this topic much longer, but in the sense of legal immigration, I think it's going to be really important that our government gets more efficient. As I know this, you know, the new party coming into the white house is very, hopefully actually going to live up to that, that statement of like making the government more efficient, getting rid of some agencies that are not needed and actually create a process that makes the great uh, or it makes legal immigration really good for the good people that actually do want to come in and do contribute to our society and become citizens and you know live up to our values and our constitution. So I, I hope you're right in in that in that term uh, because uh, diminishing population is a little interesting. Sounds like for all of those uh, those of us who are single need to start shacking up and putting some rings on some fingers so we can make that yeah. <laughs> make that a little bit. Well, little well, bit different, well if you could but, if you could start doing your part. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Hey, I'm working on it. I'm talking to someone now, so more to come later, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I, Jamie, one of the interesting things I really did want to talk to you on this episode about was some technology stuff. And I know we covered a lot of data, a lot of economics, and even some politics, which I have never done on the show. So for listeners, just know we try to be as very respectful as possible with your personal political beliefs. Um, and we don't want to impose anything there, but just take this all with a grain of salt as you can. Um, the short-term rental tech ecosystem is very interesting. Obviously, as you know, Andrew Kitchell been on multiple times. We've talked about the tech landscape and you guys are an interesting player. I was thrown off in the beginning of this announcement or early news that we got about you guys acquiring Uplisting uh, shortly after acquiring Arrivalist. So Uplisting, for those who don't know, uh, Vinny actually was on the podcast back in 2020, the co-founder of Uplisting, which is a, a great property management platform uh, for investors and operators. And it was I was surprised, a data company, why would you guys acquire a property management software? I think I know my answer, but I think many people in the industry are very confused. I maybe heard some stuff at VRMA that people were like, why would they do that? This makes no sense. But I'm like, <laughs> oh, if you look at it this way, this actually does make sense, I promise. Um, yeah. But yeah, give us a big picture of acquiring Uplisting and what this is going to do for the data and AirDNA as a brand overall. Yeah, it's funny. I was, I was when I was in Porto for Vacation Rental World Summit. I was chatting with uh, Richard Botten, and he's like industry yes. veteran that's been around for forever. And he's like, comes up to me. He's like, when I heard you guys bought Uplisting, like I just <laughs> thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> so like, let me tell you what I told Richard. Uh, cause afterwards he's like, you know what, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. So hopefully I can sort of clear the air on like why, <laughs> why we uh, at least I thought it made sense in, in terms of analyzing the direction that we wanted to go. Uh, cause when you look at, um, air DNA, um, our mm -hmm. core client base, and, and this surprises so many people, uh, is those. Uh, sort of Airbnb hosts investors with zero to let's say 10 listings. Uh, so it's not the large professional manager that we have a great business around supporting professional managers. Um, it's not um, um, I mean, hedge funds, though we do support hedge funds. It's not just DMOs that we support D DMOs. It's not just raw data that we give to the really big VRMs, but and we have a business doing that. But like over half of our revenue comes from providing data to those I mean, people that don't have a property that want to get in and those that just have a few that need simple tools, data uh, to support their business, whether it's through setting pricing strategies, setting their rates, 
um, are figuring out I mean, where they're, what market they're going to invest in uh, next and benchmarking their performance. So when you look at the sort of industry operations landscape, um, so like in the US, there's roughly 700,000 hosts. And in this number, we'll sort of track a host the same as like a property manager. So you can have a one unit host or you can have like a 500 unit host. And you think of most PMSs out there are sort of geared towards the sort of large property managers. Um, and in the US, there's about 8,000 uh, hosts that have 20 or more listings. And that's what sort of the, the guesties, the hostaways, the streamlines, the they're all sort of fighting after is, I mean, how do I enterprise. have a product, enterprise, I mean, I can make one sale, I get all their listings, I price my PMS on a per listing basis, and I can grow my business. And I sort of lock them in and I'm, I'm, they're good. Unless you're Brandy and you change your PMS every three years or every three times every year or whatever, yeah. whatever. <laughs> three, three times in like, I think last four years or something like that. It's kind of crazy, yeah. but hey, you know, to, to each their own, right? <laughs> yeah. So then you look at the rest of the ecosystem um, and we've got I mean, roughly 700 or 690,000 hosts with fewer than 20 listings. And not a whole lot of people, companies out there trying to provide services to those hosts. And what we not see is like, we can see in the data that now over 20% of those listings are cross-listed on Airbnb and Verbo. Uh, we know that more and more of them are wanting to their own direct booking site, that they want to list on, on, on booking.com, that they want to be able to list on Google Homes, that they want to professionalize. And when they go to some of the larger PMSs, like it's super complicated. It's built for a large property manager. Like I love Andrew and Wheelhouse, but their product, I think purposely so, is built for someone with 20 or more listings. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the PMSs are done the same. So we've already got this large sort of critical mass of hosts in the AirDNA ecosystem using our platform every day. Um, so uh, where could we add additional value to those hosts in a way that I mean, is sort of organic for us? Like they start their short-term rental journey with us, they find their property, they buy it, they're starting to measure their performance, they're figuring out how to expand. It's like, let's sort of include in here a PMS, uh, a way to sort of grow their business on the host side um, and that where we can keep them in the AirDNA, the AirDNA ecosystem and where they then don't have to leave to find that next I mean, sort of PMS or, or tool set. Because what most hosts need, like, and we talk to them every day, they're like, I just want simple channel, channel management. I want a simple yep. unified inbox, like where all the messages come into one spot. And I want a way to have a unified view of my calendar of where across all my channels, how everything's being booked and manage that all in one spot, easy to use, easy to understand, and that just works across all the platforms. And that's what we saw in Vidi and Uplisting, and that's what we're trying yeah. to sort of bring in and through now to, to AirDNA. I love it. And it makes so much sense because the biggest gripe I've had with vendors in our space as I we get to work with a lot of them as they're sponsoring our shows or you know going to our retreats or whatever, they all want enterprise. They're like, oh, how many units do they got? Oh, they have 10? Uh no. Nah. It's 20 or it's 20 or more. We need 20 or more or 50 or more. Some some people. Um, and I always say, like, I get that you build for enterprise because then it can make it maybe simpler to create a product or a, a light version later, but you're missing out on such an evolution of this operator that will get to 20, that will get to 50, that will get to a hundred. They just need the tool to get them there outside of Airbnb, which is trying to probably become a PMS as well, which we discussed uh, on on GMH. So it's like, okay, we we do need to focus on this, and no one's really offering them. And it kind of goes into the debate of old guard and new guard, where you know new guard doesn't feel welcome at VRMA. They feel like the content's outdated. It's very clicky, da da da. And then old guard is well, these new youngsters are trying to reinvent the wheel, and we've done this before. Like it's the same thing. We've seen this happen twenty years ago, da 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 da, and Anyways, that's my other brandy rant of the episode before really getting into uh, more topics because I know we have so much to go into and we're going to go over in an hour. 
uh, an hour on this episode, Jamie, unless you got to go soon. But what is like total addressable market is where it gets interesting because the majority of the big players right now are the hosts. In the sense of big players, they are a big portion of the inventory, the operating pie versus the traditional or enterprise vacation rental management. So what do you estimate to be the TAM for the STR industry? And how has this number evolved over recent years? Probably I'm going to just predict and assume that COVID had something to do with a a change in those numbers or predictions, but (laughs) yeah, I would love your kind of oversight. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I mean, it's, it's hard to put your finger on. I mean, but we try to sort of measure it and, and one way to measure it is sort of total industry industry revenue being generated. Because if you think about mm. like what a property manager, I mean, their sort of revenues are going to be percent of total industry revenue. Um, typically, a PMS or I mean, a dynamic pricing I mean, software provider is going to be maybe a I mean, a per listing or a percent of revenue as well. So I, I feel like that sort of total revenue number is a is a good sort of indicator of like what the market is out there today. Uh, in the US right now, it's about um, over the past 12 months, we've seen about 65 million or billion dollars generated in terms of industry revenue. Um, and wow. that's up about 16% year over year. So what's included in that is sort of the rate someone's paying and the cleaning fee. And cleaning fee is actually a pretty meaningful part of <laughs> That, that overall revenue piece. Um, and I think to many guests, suggest, again, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> um, then when you c- compare that sort of industry wide, because so many players out there are, are international. So if you're launching a tech play today, more than likely it's going to be international, not just sort of domestic focus. Because you look at listings out there, US is only 17% ish percent of total. Um, industry um, sort of supply. So U.S. is actually a pretty small piece uh, of the overall industry. Um, you look at globally, uh, short-term rentals generating about $175 billion uh, in revenue. Um, uh, so pretty significant I and mean, sort of addressable market out there. Uh, and that we saw grow at 22%. Um, so when you think about, and we talked about sort of short-term rentals compared to hotels, so we are maturing in a few key markets. And Airbnb talks about this. I think Verbo talks about this as well. Like the US, the UK, Australia, France, like um, there's a few areas where industry supply growth is not going to be growing probably 20, 30% anymore. And then there's so much of sort of the global ecosystem in so many countries where short-term rentals compared to hotels and just short-term and travel in general, I just totally under under penetrates sort of what's going on in the overall economy, uh, especially in Mm -hmm. short-term rentals, where you can just point to so much growth potential. Like in Latin America right now, revenue is growing 35%. Wow. uh, In Asia Pacific, it's growing 25% plus. Um, so there are these areas where there's just a lot of potential for future growth. Um, and that's where I, if I was thinking about like where I wanted to sort of set myself up in front of, I'd be like, all right, like, yeah, maybe I can steal some share in the U S or I grow into this market if I have something really unique, but if I can, I have a product that's going to help um, host in Latin America, help host in APAC, um, really grow uh, and make it easy to grow in these international markets. This is where we're going to see a lot of future supply growth going forward. Super insightful. So much to unpack still, but I'm curious, kind of the secondary question around all of this is, I think you've seen it. I've seen it. A lot of short-term rental investors, operators, owners, et cetera, have gotten into the space. And now we're seeing a lot of them actually get into boutique hotels, right? They're, they're buying hotels, they're flipping them, they're converting them, applying short-term rental technology, whether it's a PMS like uplisting or using air DNA data, um, maybe even like just adding some smart locks, getting rid of the front desk, you name it. 
I'm curious, is this is how blended is this going to get? Because obviously the total addressable market for short-term rentals specifically is significant, as you just stated, but how much of that now is going to blend through operators both on both sides actually kind of jumping into these different sectors? Is that going to really impact? Is that really going to make a, a difference? Or are we just seeing it because you and I see and know everybody basically in the industry that basically wants to get into boutique hotel management now? <laughs> including us. I, I'm, not, I'm guilty. I, I, we've got a hotel in Kentucky, not complaining. I'm totally here for it. Uh, but yeah, just yeah. curious if that has any kind of impact overall. Yeah. I mean, there is, I mean, on the tech space, every vendor wants to be an all-in solution. And, for sure. and you see that from AirDNA, you see that from so many others out there. Cause I mean, if you're not going to scale through just, and, and getting, uh, more listings or and having more property managers that you can sell to like grow your offerings and be able to get more revenue from each customer that you already have. Um, and th- there's also the, uh, and it's funny on the boutique hotel space, like you see so many short-term rental vendors and seeing opportunity there. And I think it goes yeah. back to the beginning of so little innovation on the hotel space and like, for sure. It, it's almost the exact same phenomenon of if you are a tech vendor in the hotel space, like I could care less about the boutique independent hotels. Like I want to cre- create tech for the I mean, large chain hotels where I get one contract through Marriott and they push it down to all their properties. Um, uh, and that's how I sort of scale my, my tech. So you've got short-term rental vendors being like, Oh, like, I can sell to one hotel and get 80 units in one like foul swoop. Like this is amazing. Um, so I mean, you do see an evolution there. Uh, I do see more innovation happening in the short terminal space, as I said. Um, but um, there is I mean, the sort of need to scale. Uh, uh, and that is a challenging one. Uh, we're mm. sort of making the bet that we can scale through a number of customers and that we can make and we can continue to so grow top of the funnel and that we get and millions of hosts sort of coming through air DNA uh, and that we can mm-hmm. convert some number of them while others it's like, all right, I, I, I know I've got to do a sales led process. I know I got to go to these conferences and get in front of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 property managers and hopefully get 10 or 15 sales out of it. It's just a different, process of going about sort of the same scale question yeah you're you're not wrong and it's very um it's very interesting like you mentioned i think you mentioned if not you um the person i was recording with before bart jan from automizer we're talking about um use and as a great property management software you can look at their marketplace actually and see a lot of short-term rental technologies uh integrating in there now you got the breezeways of the world you got the wheelhouses you have many many others i even believe you guys are in there i I can't quite remember, but I think I saw your DNA. Um, it's been a while. I haven't checked. Um, anyways, it's, it's it's a good sign of the, the the times in the sense of like, okay, I think this is going to be a little bit more significant of a play. But Jamie, before we fully wrap up this episode, I, I want to go into quick um, economic resilience and and kind of risk factors, right? Like I think a lot of people... It's, it's been a kind of a tough year for a lot of operators. We, we've seen operators go out of business. We've seen the lack of funding and acquisition you know, activity happen. But what shifts in, uh, I, I guess not even what shifts, what macroeconomic risk factors do you believe could disrupt the short-term rental market in this near future? I think we're all kind of, we've been anticipating for the election to be done. Now it's done. What's the macros kind of telling you and what can the listeners kind of expect in the short term? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty b- bullish on the economy going forward. I would have been no matter who's in the White House. Um, we're yeah. in a lot of ways seeing one of the best economies we've ever had. Um, we've got record low unemployment. Um, we've got stable inflation now. Uh, we've got a housing market that, while not healthy, um, is and prices are stable. Uh, I'd hate to be a realtor right now, though, just with I mean, the lack of inventory and the uh, um, lack of and sort of transactions happening. Uh, but it really points well, out the changes of like, on their commission too. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they had to change that whole. Yeah. No, sorry. That when you look overall at the economy, it's really great, but there's sort of pockets that are in recession and in and seeing pain. Uh, certain, and you see that in the industry too. Like on overall, like we're growing rev par by two or three percent right now. Occupancy is pretty stable. We're getting a little bit of rate growth. Like, but that's not to say like out of the six thousand submarkets that we track, like twenty five hundred of them are seeing rev par declines. Um, there's mm-hmm. certain aspects of the business, certain markets. Like if you were a big winner around domestic trends during COVID, I and mean, now everyone's traveling international again. Like I'm mean, you're sitting on the coast in Florida, you're sitting in Orlando, like it's been a tough year or two um as sort of sure. travel trends have normalized. Um so that's where I and mean, yes, the overall macro picture looks great. And I feel pretty confident that people are gonna travel. Uh, people are going to spend uh, and have discretionary income uh, and that we're going to continue this long term sort of pull uh, where more and more people want to spend a larger share of their income on travel and experiences than they are on on purchase on purses and bikes or what, whatever they might they <laughs> might be buying before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that materialistic stuff. Yeah. When, when you look at overall travel. Like of all the different sectors, short-term rentals are still uh, growing the fastest. So like if you're going to sort of position yourself in some some sort of like tailwind, like we've got more and more people that are going to continue to travel, spend money uh, on travel uh, and short-term rentals are going to continue to take a greater and greater share of that overall um, sort of travel spend. Like I think this is an industry that is good for the long term, yes, there's going to be some near-term bumps here and there, um, and you're going to have to think about how to adjust your uh, uh, business model. You're going to have to and continue to evolve how you attract guests, how do you evolve, and how do you get customers. But I'm still very bullish on the long-term sort of outlook for short terminals. Hey, if you're bullish, I guess I have to be bullish too. I'm gonna I'm gonna bet on you instead of uh, my own gut because I'm like I don't feel like inflation is controlled, but you know, if you say it is, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen. You know, I'm, I I I feel like I'm getting crushed with it, but uh, it's like okay, let's let's go. Um, if Jamie Lane is bullish, I'll I'll, I'll be bullish. I'll be optimistic and try not to to look at the last year and a half or at least even the last two quarters even and just be like, oh my gosh. Um, but Jamie, this is so good. I I think we have to do a part two. I think we have to. Um, in the sense of there are so many other topics and questions I wanted to ask you leading into this episode that we're unable to cover due to schedules but jamie for the first time on slick talk how do you think you did how do you think the listeners enjoyed this because i think you crushed it I, this has been such a fun conversation so i think we're gonna have to do a part two we just have we have uh, to. maybe a part two part three part four part five part six uh we'll, 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 hey so <laughs> I, I i i'm happy to come back anytime you want to you want to chat will do you want to be another repeating guest host uh, every month on this show too? <laughs> Just get, get that cycle not. going. <laughs> no. Absolutely. <laughs> For the listeners, Jamie Lane is on so many podcasts, so many stages, so uh, obviously your own podcast too. So I won't be offended by you not wanting to be a guest host on Slick Talk, but one day I will convince you. We'll get a big sponsor and I'll be like, Jamie, I have an offer you can't refuse. Um, <laughs> but until then, I always like to ask a question for for listeners. Obviously, I don't think you are a new name to a lot of people listening to this episode, but for those that haven't connected with you on LinkedIn or email or wherever, where would you want them to go? Because I know um, there's so, again, so many topics that we've covered on this episode that I'm I would be surprised if you weren't flooded with messages and want to make sure that the listeners can get to you easily. Yeah. And I'm pretty active on both uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. So uh, search me for me there. You can find me. Uh, and then, and we and my team write a lot of content. So if you're interested in the type of things we're talking about, go to the RDNA's blog. We probably put out 20, 30 blogs a month, uh, probably more than any other sort of yeah, uh, company out there. Uh, we've got a whole team. We're digging into topics all the time uh, that are really, I think, relevant to both operators, investors, property managers. Like, and it's it's good stuff out there. And kudos to the team for uh, continuing to run with any random idea I have on a potential research idea. <laughs> 
I, I love it. And also for the listeners that don't know, Jamie Land is not only an economist and working at AirDNA and doing all these things and talking about all the stuff that we just talked about, but you're also now a host yourself. Jamie's lane change has happened. I think we're episode six, episode five into the series that you guys have created at AirDNA. How's that yeah. process going of you investing in a short-term rental getting it up, using vendors in the industry from, you know, uh, not staging companies, but design to furnishing to your own technology. Like, can you just give us a quick uh, glimpse yeah, so, into your hosting experience so far? Yeah, I wanted to sort of put my money where my mouth is, sort of eat your dog food, whatever the metaphor is of uh, <laughs> yeah. going. And we decided to tape it uh, sort of soup to nuts of finding a market, finding a property, uh, and then getting into um, furnishing, staging, uh, and operating. Uh, so we've just had guests for, uh, nice. <laughs> stay at the property, uh, uh, all five-star reviews so far. Uh, but it was awesome and way more work than I expected a whole, whole lot more fun than I expected to. Um, so, um, yeah. And my wife and I had hosted early days of Airbnb, like back in, in yeah. 2011, 2012 for a long time. And now we've sort of got into the sort of investing in a dedicated home uh, that I'm, will hopefully be cash flow positive and a great investment for us. To, but we'll see. Uh, and we'll uh, keep <laughs> everyone uh, sort of updated along the way. But you can find that on AirDNA's YouTube channel, uh, Jamie's Lane Change. For sure. I was going to say for all the listeners, there's going to be quite a few links in this episode, actually, because we're going to link the STR Data Lab, obviously, some other stuff that we've seen you on stage speak about, and then also your Jamie's Lane Change on YouTube. It's a great series. Congrats to you and like obviously Austin and the other team members at RDNA have put this together. It's actually really uh, entertaining and, and fun to watch. And so I think you guys really came at a really good approach for listeners that want to see this experience. Go for it. It's actually really incredible. Uh, so I'll make sure that's all linked in the show notes, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, all that will be in there too. So for the slick talkers out there, like subscribe, give Jamie Lane all the love from the show and show him how much this conversation meant to you as we're going to get to a part two, part three, part four, part five, part six, part seven, part eight. I'm just kidding. Uh, in the near future, obviously 2025, we're gonna have a lot to cover and shameless plug. You can see Jamie once a month or more times, depending on the topics that we pick for good morning hospitality. We'd love to have you guys over there too. And Jamie, until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Will. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast possible. We hope you enjoyed the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week.